Hello and welcome back. In this lesson, you're going to be learning the basics of the Python programming language. It's going to be a fun ride. I hope you're ready. Let's go. Here is our list of learning objectives. If you like, you can pause the video and read through these, but we're going to come back to them at the end of the video. Now note that in this lesson, we're going to cover a lot of material. So it may feel like a fire hose initially, but do not fear. This is material that you're going to keep encountering throughout the course. And over time, it will become more familiar and less scary. In this lesson, we're going to be using the Google Colab coding environment. So I'm going to go ahead and search Google Colab on Google. And you should do that as well. And I'll click on this first link here, colab.research.google. And I look around and try to find a button for a new notebook. And I see it's here. And I click on that. Now I'm going to give my notebook the name coding underscore basics. If you don't know how to work with these notebooks, we have a separate video on that. So you can check it out. Let's start by talking about comments. So I'm going to add a new text cell here and give it a header of comments. And I want you to try to type along everything that I'm typing with me so that at the end of this, you have a nice tutorial in order to revise your learning. So here I'm going to write comments are text that is ignored by Python. They are used to explain what code is doing. So let's see an example of how to work with comments. I'm going to press shift enter to open now a new code cell. And in this code, I'm going to write some comments. Specifically, I'm going to write the comment addition. Now notice what I just did there. I used the hash or the pound symbol. And then I put this text here. This is what makes this a comment. So even though this text is inside of a code cell, it's not going to be evaluated as code. It's going to be treated as a comment. So now I can put the text two plus two here. And if I press control or command enter to run that code, it may take a little while since the code here is connecting to Python, but after a while, you should see the output of four. If I remove the hashtag and I just press command enter here, you will see we're going to get an error because now it thinks addition is a piece of code and it says addition is not defined. So I put that hashtag to indicate that this is a comment. Now I noticed that in this lesson, we've used the hashtag here as a code comment. But we also used it here as a header inside of Markdown. Try not to get confused between the two. Comments are used inside of code cells to differentiate the code from the explanations of the code. And inside of a Markdown cell or inside of a text cell, you can use this hashtag or this pound symbol in order to delineate a header. Now let's see some other ways we can write comments. I'm going to press Shift Enter to go to the next code cell. And I'll show you that you can also write a comment on the same line as the code, but you have to put it after the code. So if I write two plus two there and I put a hash and then addition, if I run this, it should run fine. And we get the output of four. We can also write multiple lines of comments. So I can write addition and then I can say maybe add two numbers and then I write two plus two. And if I run this, everything looks fine. If you have a very long comment, you can use triple quotes to write it. So let's see an example of that. I'm going to open a new code chunk. And let's say I want to write all of this addition, add two numbers. And then I also wanted to write again below, I add two numbers. This is a lot of comments for just a simple uh, piece of code, but it's an example. Instead of all of these hashtags, I could also do something like this. I'm going to put three quotes at the start, one, two, three, and then three quotes at the end, one, two, three. And ideally these should go on a new line. So new line there and new line there. And all of these now will be treated as comments. So let's put the code there, two plus two, and then press again, command enter or control enter if you're on Windows. And we see that that works. Instead of this single quote symbol, this apostrophe looking symbol, you can also use double quotes like this. Okay, so double, triple quotes, or triple, double quotes, whoops. And that gives the same result. All right, now here's a practice question for you. So let's call this your practice question one. And here I'll give you four pieces of code with four different ways of writing comments. And you tell me which of these are valid. So not all of them are gonna be valid. So here I'll say add two numbers, okay? 
and I'll say here 2 plus 2. So that's one example. Here's another way. And you tell me if this is valid. Add two numbers. Here's a third way. You tell me if this is valid. Add two numbers. Okay. And 2 plus 2. And here's the last way. You decide whether this is valid. Add two numbers. 2 plus 2. So pause the video and think about these. And when you're done, try them out to see which were correct. Next, let's think of how to use Python as a simple calculator. I'm going to open a new text cell here and use a header and say Python as a calculator. Again, remember that here inside of a text cell, the hash or pound symbol means header, but inside of a code cell, it means comment. And I press shift enter to go to the next line of code. So Python works as a simple calculator. So you've already seen 2 plus 2, but you can also do, of course, 2 minus 2. 2 minus 2, which gives us 0. We can do 2 divided by 2 with this slash symbol. So 2 divided by 2 should give us, of course, 1. We can do 2 times 2 with an asterisk. Okay. And if we use 2 asterisks, that is 2 raised to the power of 2. So there it gives us the same answer because 2 raised to the power of 2 is 4. But let's try 2 raised to the power of 4 and see what that gives us. That's 16. So those are operations that should be very familiar to you. Here's one that may not be familiar to you, the modulo operator. So the modulo operator is kind of like a remainder operator. So if I type 10 and then the percent sign, which is the sign for the modulo operator, and then 3, it's going to give me the remainder when you divide 10 by 3. Hopefully you know that that is 1. So we get the value of 1 there. And here's another interesting operator, the floor division operator. So if I type 10 and two divided signs, two slashes there, three, this is going to give me the rounded value of 10 divided by three. So 10 divided by three, of course, is 3.333. Okay. But it'll round this down to the nearest integer. So now I press control enter and you see it gives us three there. All right. So try some basic practice with this. I'm going to open another code chunk and I press shift enter. And here are two things or two uh, mathematical operations. I want you to guess what is going to be the output. So 5 modulo 4, guess what the output of that is going to be. And then 5 floor division 4, also guess that. And when you're done, you can run those and see if you were correct. Now let's make a new text section and call it order of operations. So because Python is a sensible calculator, it generally follows the order of operations. So as an example, if I type 2 plus 2 times 2, take a second and guess what the answer to this is going to be. So let's control enter and see that it's 6. Okay, that's because the multiplication sign has a higher priority than the plus sign. So we get 2 times 2, which is 4, and then we add that to 2, uh, so 6. If we just went in order from left to right, it would have been 2 plus 2, 4, 4 times 2, 8. But it follows the order of operations. So let's do some practice on that simple topic of order of operations. I'm going to put that uh, text cell. And then let me give you two code cells. So what I want you to do is tell me uh, which of these evaluates to 10. So does this evaluate to 10? And here's the code. 2 plus 2 times 4. So tell me whether that evaluates to 10. And how about this? Does it evaluate to 10? 6 plus 2 raised to the power of 2. So think about your order of operations and tell us whether those evaluate to 10. And after you finish guessing, you should test it out to see if your guesses were correct. Next, let's look at using the math library. Using the math library. So we can use something called a library to access some functionality that isn't built directly into Python itself. And math is a very common example of such a library. In order to use this, I'm going to open a new code cell and I'm going to type import math. So that imports the math library. And let's use the square root function from the math library. I'm going to type math.sqrt. And I'm going to open a pair of parentheses 
and I type the number 100 in there. And if I press Command Enter, try to guess what we're going to get, we get the value of 10.0. Let's see another example. I'm going to use now the math.log function. So here I don't have to import math again because I already imported it above. So here I'm going to get the logarithm of 100. This is the natural logarithm. And we see that that's 4.6 blah blah blah. So some basic vocabulary terms. We said math is a library. SQRT and log are functions. And 100 here is an argument. So maybe you should write that down actually. So here math is a library. Log. Log is a function from that library. And 100 is the argument to that function. These are terms you're going to keep hearing a lot. Okay, now let's get you some practice on using that library or on using libraries in general. The first thing I want you to do is to use the relevant function from the math library to calculate the square root of 81. So do that here in this code chunk. And here's another practice question. I'm going to write a bunch of code. So this code generates a random number between 1 and 10, or we could say a random integer, import random, random dot rand int 1 comma 10. So if I run this code, we can see it generates a random number. I can do it again. And now we have another one. And the question for you is, write a sentence identifying the library function and argument here. Okay, so I want you to say something like in this code, the blah, blah library, something, something function, something, something argument. So use those three vocabulary terms to describe what's going on here. Okay, let's open up a new section and call it uh, spacing, spacing in code. So the first thing we're going to talk about is indentation in your code. And this is very important for the Python programming language in particular. We're going to look at it properly when we talk about functions and we talk about if then statements. But as a very simple example here, let's say I wrote this following code, uh, hashtag addition or hash hashtag add two plus two. And then on the next line, instead of writing two plus two at the start of the line, I put a bunch of spaces accidentally before it. If I try to run this code, you see that it says indentation error, unexpected indent. So we need to make sure we start this from the beginning in this case. Another point about spacing is that in general, it's useful to have spaces in between different uh, chunks of your code. So as an example, let's say I wrote here x is equal to 5. So I'm setting x equal to 5 and y is equal to 10, setting uh, y equal 10. And I want to say maybe x plus y, x plus y. And I have some comments explaining what I'm doing here. So create x and y. And then here I say maybe add x and y. Instead of writing the code all together like this, it could help in the way you have uh, paragraphs for text. It could help to have some uh, spacing here, specifically here, separating the creation aspect from the addition aspect. So this is an example where some spacing could be useful. Another place where spacing is useful is around operators. So if I write maybe 1 plus, let's say, uh, z equals 1 plus 2 plus 3, this is a little bit hard to read. So generally, we recommend that there should be spaces around these operators. So z equals 1 space plus 2 space plus 3 space, and so on. So next, let's talk about variables in Python. Variables in Python. Now, as we have already seen above, we can create something called a variable in Python using the equal to sign. So if I write something like um, my, or let's call it var, where var stands for variable, is equal to 2 plus 2, and I run this with control or command enter, what I have done is I have created a variable called var, I could call it anything, that stores the output of this code 2 plus 2. And so if in a new line of code here, I just type VAR and I press uh, control enter, it will give me the output there of four. Let's give another example. I'm going to change this VAR to maybe my VAR and I change two plus two to three plus three. Okay. And I change the output here to my VAR. 
Now if I run this line, and then I also run the next line, you see that my var now is 6. So we have created those two variables, and we can actually see them here in the Colab environment if we click on this button for variables. Sometimes it may take a while for those to come up, and you may actually need to refresh uh, your Google Colab environment in order to see it. But now we can see this my var here, which has the value of 6, and var as well, which has the value of 4. So you can think of these variables as containers that hold a certain value. And if you want to extract that value from the container, you just put the name of the container, and you run it, and the value will be spat out. Here's another example of a variable. I'm going to call it first underscore name and set that equal to the name Joanna. Notice here that I use a pair of quotes since I'm typing some text. We'll talk about that soon. And I can view the first name here. So type again first name. And so I've stored Joanna inside of the first name variable. And here I am outputting that to this line. Now a quick point on some basic kinds of variables. We have seen above here a string variable. This Joanna example is called a string variable, and it just means we have a bunch of text that we're trying to store in something. You can also have what are called uh, integer variables, integer variable, which is kind of a whole number. So for example, um, I say number equals five. That's an example of an integer variable. And finally, you can have what's called a float or float variable. And a float is something that's a decimal. So if I say maybe height equals 1.4, this is going to be stored as a float. And maybe let's change this number to age, so it seems like a more reasonable list of variables. And we can check these different types of variables using the type function. So if I do type, and then I put first name in there, whoops, first name, and I press Control Enter, you see it says str, which is string. If I do it for age, you see it says int, which is integer. And finally, if I do it for height, whoops, height, we see it says float, which is not an abbreviation, but just the word float. We can easily reassign variables. So if up here I set first name to Joanna, later on, I could just change that and set first name maybe to John. And now if I print the value of first name, I can see that the output now is John and no longer Joanna. And if I check in my list of variables, I should see the same thing there as well. The first name now has the value of John. Now let's look at some examples of things that we can do with these variables. I can take, for example, the square root of this age variable that I created there by just typing, if you remember, math.sqrt, and I put the word age in there. And if I press Control Enter, I can see the square root of that person's age. So here, the math.square root function is looking for the value of age, and it's finding that square root. Here's another example. Maybe I want to get the length of a variable. So here I'm going to type the function len, which gets the length. And let's get the length of first name. I remember first name has the value now of John. So if I run this, we can see it has a length of 4. And that is basically the number of letters in that string of John. So it's not getting the number of letters in first name, in the string first name. It's rather getting the number of letters in the value of first name, which is John. Hopefully that is clear. Now let's look at how to concatenate, concatenate strings. Concatenate is a fancy word for join. So let's define a number of variables again. Let's say first name equals super and last name equals Mario. And now I can define a full name variable and say that's equal to first name plus last name. And if on the next line I try to print the full name variable, and let's go ahead and run this, you can see that we get Super Mario. Maybe we want to add a space between the first and the last name. We can do that by just putting an empty space in between quotes and then another plus there. And now we have Super Mario uh, written out correctly. Okay, now here's some practice for you in understanding what variables do. Okay, so practice on variables. I'm going to write a bunch of code. 8 equals 9. Answer equals 8 minus 8. And then answer. Sorry, I mean answer here, not answers. 
So what I want you to do is just by looking at this code, try to guess what the value of answer is and then run the code to see if you were correct. We're getting very close to the end now. Let's talk about a useful Python tool called user input. So I'm going to make a new section and call it getting user input. And here I'm going to show you a cool tool in Python called the input function. And let's see what the input function does. So I'm just going to type input and close open and close parentheses and press command enter. And you see it gives you an input and you can type in something here, maybe hello. And as you can see, that input is returned to us. And so it gives us the output of hello. But let's do something a bit more useful. Let's say that we're going to store the input inside of a variable called name. So name equals input. Let's run that again. And here I put in my name of Kenneth. And below, I can do something with that name. I'm going to do print. And I'll put the string hello. And comma. And my name there of Kenneth. So let's run this again. So I put in my name, Kenna. And as you can see, it says, hello, Kenna. How nice. We can also give an argument to the input function. And we'll just write, uh, what is your name? And so now, when I run this, you see it asks, what is your name? So I can type again, Kenna Nuosu. And again, we see, hello, Kenna Nuosu. Let's try another example. I'm going to open a new code block. I'll copy this one with controller command C. And I'll paste it in there. And we're going to try to do something interesting with the name. Specifically, we're going to uh, check its length. So length of the name. And we'll print this in a nice way. So let's run it first. What is your name? And we say Kenna. And the length of Kenna is 4, of course. But let's print this in a nice way. So I say print. And then I'll say your, your name has, comma, length name. Let's put a space there comma, letters, and close the parentheses. Make sure you type this exactly as you see here. Okay, actually, we need a space there as well. And let's run all that. Your, what is your name? My name is Kenna. Your name has four letters. Actually, we don't need these spaces. <laughs> we can remove them. Okay. So here's a practice question for you using input. Practice with input. And what you're going to do is write a short program that takes in a user's favorite color and says X color. So whatever the user gave is my favorite color too. Okay, so you build a nice AI chatbot uh, using that simple uh, program. Next, let's talk about a very common error you're going to run into when you're working with variables. So I make a new text section and I call it uh, errors, a common error with variables. And the error is a very simple error and is what I call the undefined error. It's going to say that xxx variable is not defined. So let's look at an example. Let's say I type Victor's age, Victor age, Victor's age is equal to 20. And I want to add this age to 5. Maybe I'm doing a calculation with his age. And I type a Victor's age again, plus 5. Okay. Now, hopefully, you can already see the problem. Let me try and run this and see what happens. So as you can see, I got an error. Usually, the most important part of the error is going to be around the bottom. And so it says here, Victor's age is not defined, which is surprising because I thought I defined it right up there. Well, as you may know, Python, like pretty much every programming language, is case sensitive. And here, what I defined was Victor's age with a small v. And then I snuck in a capital V on the second line. So I need to change that to a small V. And now if I run that again, you see that Victor's age plus 5 is 25. All right. So as a comment to remind myself, I'm going to say here Python. Whoops. Python is case sensitive. So be careful. Python is case sensitive. I can't spell anymore because I am quite tired. <laughs> When you first start working with Python, you're going to run into many, many errors. And dealing with these errors can be quite frustrating, but it's important to build that muscle for spotting errors because that's a big part of programming.
Spotting and fixing errors is one place where large language models like ChatGPT are amazing. But for a beginner like you, I recommend that you avoid using those tools just to get started with so you can build that muscle a little bit. But eventually, you should definitely bring these tools into your workflow. Okay, so now I'm going to give you another practice question. Let's make a new section and call it practice and then a new code section under that. And I'm going to say here, my first name is equal to Kenna and my last name is equal to Nuosu. And I'm going to try to uh, print these two together. So print my first name and my last name. Okay. Now, um, without running this code, just looking at my code alone, try to figure out what is the problem. I can tell you that it's going to give me an error. In fact, let me just run that so I can show you it gives me an error. So it says name error. I won't show you the error, um, but try to figure out what the error is and correct it and write the correct code. So now our final topic, let's talk about naming variables. So I make a new section and I call it naming variables. So here's a quote from a guy called Phil Carlton. You don't have to write this down, but he says that there are only two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. I don't really understand cache and validation, but I know that naming things is quite difficult. One of the reasons is that you want your name to be both short so that it's easy to type as you're working, but it should also be informative so it tells us what is stored inside of that variable. So as an example, let's say you're working later on with some data set and you call it something like sample, sample of the outbreak data from Ebola, Sierra Leone in 2024. This is a very clear name, but it will make your code very hard to read because it's super long. On the other hand, if you imported a data set and called it data, that's also not a great name. So I'm going to write a comment here that says uh, names, names should balance brevity, which means they should be kind of short with clarity, which means they should make clear what they contain. That's a very simple guide for you. An important thing about naming variables is that names need to follow special conventions. What do I mean by that? As we've seen, when we're creating variables, we can separate two words, for example, first and name with an underscore. So here I type first name equals Kenneth. And importantly, an underscore is the only kind of symbol that you can include inside of a variable name. So if instead I tried to do first space name, this is going to give me an error. Or if I tried first hyphen name, that will also give me an error. So names need to be composed only of letters, as you can see, underscores, and also numbers. So I can put a number here, first name underscore one, and that works. But an important thing about the numbers is that they can't be at the start of the name. So if I try to put one first name, this is not going to work. Okay, so let's, uh, let's comment this out so it doesn't keep giving us that error. There are three main ways of naming multi-word variables. We've already seen something like this, first underscore name. This is called snake case. So here we can define a variable just to help us remember and say snake case uses underscores between words. The other kind is camel case. So for camel case, the first letter um, is going to be small. But after that, for subsequent words, you have a capital. So here I'm going to write here. Whoops. Sorry, I made a mistake there. Here I'm going to write a camel case capitalizes new words but not the first word, but not the first word, okay? And last but not least, we have Pascal case. So Pascal case capitalizes all new words, okay? Including the first, including the first. The most common type of name you'll see in the Python ecosystem is this one, the snake case, and it's the one that we'll use mostly for our coding. And now your last practice question, I'm gonna put a new section and call it practice. Whoops, practice. I'm going to put here a bunch of variable names, and you need to figure out which of those is a valid name and an invalid name, and comment beside it whether it's valid or invalid. So this one I'm going to call first name. First name equals John. And you tell me whether or not that's a valid name. Last name equals Doe. Uh, full name equals John Doe. Age in years equals 30. Current job, current job, 
equals developer uh, phone number equals five 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 one two three four five whoops phone number equals five five one two three four five and I say secret code equals uh, 42 so figure out which of these are valid names and uh, comment uh, appropriately So now let's go through our list of learning objectives to see if you've mastered everything. By now you should know how to write and use comments in Python. You should know how to use Python as a calculator for basic arithmetic operations. You should know how to use the math library for some simple mathematical operations. I wrote complex there, but really what we did was quite simple. You understand how to use proper spacing in your Python code. You can create and manipulate variables of different types, strings, integers, and floats. You can get user input and perform some simple manipulations on that. You understand the basic rules and the best practices for naming variables in Python, and you can identify and fix common errors related to variable usage. So congratulations on getting through this long and dense Python Foundations lesson. In this lesson, you have covered a lot of the fundamentals of the Python programming language. You know about code and comments, you know how to do mathematical operations, you know how to work with variables, and you've also seen the basics of functions and libraries. If you don't yet feel comfortable with all of the material, that's okay. We've taught you a lot in a short period of time, and it's going to take time to consolidate all of these concepts. But if you've managed to get this far, you are on very good footing. So congratulations again, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.